Great. Uh, well, in that case, Adnan, I will hand over to you. Yeah, thanks. Um, let's just take a second to jump over the first uh, slide or two to just thank the sponsors for making this event possible. Once again, the code of conduct, there is a quick version over here. You can also take a look on the on the site itself. But yeah, basically what Eleanor just said, just be just be a nice person. And that's basically it. But yeah, so now we've come to the gist of uh, the talk itself. Um, and let me just start by by showing you this short video. And this is a GIF I, I tend to jump into or just find randomly on Twitter every once in a while. And it represents latency in real life, like a real life scenario of what it would look like if you had latency in your day to day. And don't you just hate it? I mean, don't you just hate the latency? I mean, I, I, it's dreadful for me. It's absolutely dreadful. And I've been like, personally, I've been in this situation uh, a few times and that was especially, especially the last time or actually the first time I started and wanted to build the data app on top of a data warehouse. And it was quite literally a dumpster fire, as you can see here in the, in the GIF, it was, was not pretty, it was not pretty at all. And that's quite literally what I want to talk about today. So my goal for this whole talk is to give you a crash course um, about data warehouses and their performance, but not just that. I want to explain how to understand performance of data APIs. I want you to, to understand how it works. I want to highlight a few tools that will help you build responsive data apps, but not just any data apps, data apps on top of data warehouses. And that's basically the, the gist of, of the whole talk, like the point I want to get across. Now, if we move on, uh, first of all, I need to tell you who I am because you're obviously sitting there right now and going, yeah, who, who is this guy to tell us about this stuff? Well, uh, to keep it short, I'm, I'm Adnan and I'm a developer advocate at the Cube team. Uh, the, the, the Cube team, we're, we're, we're a startup and we're building a, an open source and a cloud version of an analytics API. And the point of it is to make data apps fast and responsive. So technically, if you think about it, I, I should kind of know what I'm talking about, uh, but I'll let you decide on that uh, once we go ahead with the talk itself. Um, just a bit more about myself before we go into details. It's just, uh, I'm, I'm a node dev and I've been a node dev for a long time and I'm a DevOps advocate at heart is I've been writing JavaScript for a very long time since before Yarn was open sourced. So I've been doing this for quite a while. And I swear I look much older than I actually am because of the early years of JavaScript torture. And by torture, I mean development. I guess you all know what I'm talking about if, you, if you've been doing JavaScript development back in the early days. But yeah, now you, you may be wondering why I moved from engineering to DevRel. And it's quite simple. And it's just because I've been teaching people to code for such a long time, like almost five years now. Um, I've been creating and crafting courses, teaching them both offline and online for, for almost five years, a bit more actually. And it was just natural for me to do the shift. Now, yeah, but let's go through the agenda real quick. Once we got all of those formalities out of the way. So the agenda is, is quite simple. There are four main things uh, that I want to talk about. First of all, uh, I want to talk about data warehouses, but not just any. Any type, I want to talk about data warehouses from the standpoint of a developer, of an app developer. So basically a person like myself and hopefully people like you who are listening. And I want to talk about performance and two main points of performance. I want to talk about bottlenecks and benchmarks. So I want to show you where the bottlenecks are and how to run benchmarks to actually see those bottlenecks and how to figure out how to improve them. So we want to get sub-second latency. That's the ideal goal we want to get and that everybody wants to have, but not just any sub-second latency. We want this sub-second latency to be paired with high concurrency. So you want to have high concurrency, but maintain this sub-second latency. And of course, the last part uh, of the talk is going to be about building data apps, but not just building them, but building them on top of data warehouses. Now that's going to be the hard part. And that's something we're going to be rounding off the talk with. So yeah, by, by going and starting from the beginning, uh, step number one is to talk about data warehouses in general, what they are and how they work. Now, this is a perfect, perfect theme that I tend to go back to uh, because it, it, this was me not so long ago, and you can't really blame me. Um, I build apps. I'm not supposed to know everything about data warehouses. I'm not supposed to, to know how they work and how to load data from them. And that's pretty much the, the basis of this entire talk is I want to share the knowledge I gained with all of you people, all of you devs out there that want to learn more about using data warehouses. 
and building data apps on top of them. So just to go and talk about general, general subjects and just the, uh, to keep it simple, uh, a data warehouse is generally just a single source, source of truth. Now it's a central location for all of the multiple sources of data that you have. Now, the way you load the data is through ETL and that's extract, transform and load. And you load data into the data warehouse from all of your different sources. Now you generally do this to get reporting and data analysis uh, because you want some business insights uh, from this data warehouse. Now, generally data warehouses are usually optimized for running low volumes of uh, complex analytical queries. Now these queries end up having like massive joins of tables with over a billion, uh, billion rows. So these queries are often, they have numerical calculations in them, like using aggregate functions with averages, counts, et cetera, et cetera. So they're heavy, heavy queries. And they're usually characterized by, by scanning a lot of data. So it's vast amounts of data that get scanned. And as a consequence, data warehouses are often auto-scaling, meaning they're heavily distributed systems. They use columnar storage engines, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, uh, this is generally, uh, the, this whole behavior that I'm explaining right now is what defines something we call online analytical processing. And this is what is, is defined by OLAP. Now, as opposed to OLAP, we have OLTP, which is online transaction processing. And it's, it's literally just a switch where it, it means you're running high volumes of not complex queries, and you're generally mostly inserting and updating data rather than reading it, but you're also scanning low amounts of data if you end up reading the data. So the amount of uh, data you scanned is very low in comparison to, to OLAP. And here's a, here's a perfect representation I wanna show you is that if you're running uh, queries that scan a few rows, doesn't really matter if they're low query volume or high, using OLTP would be the best bet. If you're using uh, queries that scan huge amounts of data, they, you know, you can kind of, kind of go about doing it with low query volume by using OLAP. And then you have this, this high query volume with high data, high data scanned. It's just this unicorn that's can be unobtainable. It's, it's very hard to get. Now, the question we pose now is, is does this unicorn exist? Like, is, is it possible? Uh, is it a viable option? And to make it viable, you need to think uh, in a special way. You need to think about it from the state of using materialized views. Now, materialized views are a set of pre-computed results from queries. Now, uh, you also would need something called OLAP cubes to make this possible. And I just mentioned OLAP, and this is why, why it's important is that uh, OLAP cubes are pre-computed multi-dimensional data sets. And by using these cubes, these OLAP cubes, you can filter a data set by one or more dimensions and then aggregate the values along these dimensions. So this is something you don't get out of the box with data warehouses. And you know, that, that's what makes it hard to build data apps because the hard part is making the apps consume the data. And if we don't have that out of the box with data warehouses, then that's a huge problem. So as an app developer, you need to figure out how to make these, these apps and how to build them in a responsive and performant way. You know, you need to make them responsive and, and performant, uh, but you also need to keep the business and, and, and all of your users happy, meaning the business needs to stay happy by not spending millions of, of dollars on this. And then also you have to keep the users happy by keeping the, lat the latency down, you know, and, you know, this makes it complicated. And, and also this notion of responsive and performant, it's very, very vague. You know, what is it, what does it really mean to be responsive and performant? Um, but yeah, let me, let me segue into that. Let me, let's talk about performance and let's try and understand what this actually means. So, as you can see, when we're talking about performance, uh, this was me not so long ago. Uh, when I was building my first metrics dashboard that uh, was consuming data from a data warehouse, uh, this was literally the face I made. And you can't really blame me. I'm not supposed to know these things. I'm not supposed to know how to consume data the right way. I'm not supposed to know how it all works. Um, but the point behind this, this entire talk is just to, to share the knowledge I gained and how performance works. Now, so when we were thinking about the notion of responsive and performant, uh, I would love that my users have the feeling that they're operating directly on the data. It doesn't really matter what the operation is. 
doesn't really matter how, how big the data volume is or how many users are, are acting on the data in parallel, so the concurrency. And what I can say is that from all of the studies that I did I read and, and, and look at is that a ra an app seems to be reacting instantaneously if it responds to user actions that are within 10 milliseconds. Now, anything above one second is risking to interrupt the flow of thought of the user. So anything above a second is just a no-no. You just do not want, want to see that ever. Um, and for a reference point here, is that the average time it takes to blink is a tenth of a second. So that's 100 milliseconds. And that's a perfect benchmark I want everybody to remember. And also where I want to introduce a term called query latency. And then query latency in this sense is the amount of time it takes to execute the query and then receive a result. And as an app dev, you need to know of all of the reasons why latency can, can be slow and, and can be in this sense, uh, impacting the response times. So what actually does impact latency? Um, primarily, it's the amount of data that needs to be scanned, which makes sense. It's, it's very, very logical when you think about it, where if you have larger data sets, the scans to scan all of the data take a well, longer time, more time. So to distribute this load, uh, data warehouses often end up using multiple nodes that are uh, you know, they have internode communications in between them. And then this introduces another level level of, of delay, delay there. So, the, you know, it's, it's not a simple problem to, to solve. And what does this all mean for us uh, as, as devs, as app devs? Well, if you think of it this way, sending data over a network is bas basically just sending a bunch of ones and zeros at the speed of light through fiber op optic cables. I mean, it's not, it's not nothing more than that, but if you take that into account, if you take into account the speed of light, um, and then imagine that you have a user in California uh, sending a request to your app that's deployed in US East 1 because that's just a, a very popular region on AWS. And then you have the round trip that's twice the distance of uh, 3,000 miles, and the speed of light is 186,000 miles a second. You get to, to this. It's, it's obviously should take 30 milliseconds. You know, that's the minimum delay between sending the request and getting the response. Um, but then again, you might have users overseas and then you can use CDNs, but then CDNs don't really make sense um, because you know it's not very practical for data warehouses um, to have. So yeah, it, this, is, this is just poses so many questions and so many problems. And then it doesn't really stop there either because uh, the world is not ideal, as we all know, the world is definitely not ideal. So there are several other factors you also need to take into account and the first one is obviously network delays, but you also have to take into account the, the query execution time, like the time it takes for the data warehouse to, to generate the result from the query you send. And then you also have to take into account the business logic you have on top of the data. So the time it would take to run the business logic. So that's another step. And then we come to this. Any request that your app makes, it definitely should take less than one second if you take into account the, the speed of light. But also, if we go back to the time it takes to blink, and that is 100 milliseconds, that would be the ideal, like the ideal benchmark. So anything around there and, and below is just ideal. Anything above that would be tolerable, but anything above one second, yeah, that just, that's just unacceptable. So uh, let's talk about something more concrete. We got the basics now, and let's, let's talk about what generally query latency in BigQuery means and, and how it works. So uh, first, of all, uh, first of all, BigQuery is a serverless big data warehouse, and it's part of GCP, uh, the Google Cloud Platform. We all know that. Um, and it's also highly scalable, uh, which means that it doesn't really matter if the data set is tiny or if it's huge, as in petabytes. It, it will crunch those, uh, those numbers and all of that data within seconds. So it will just uh, scale out based on a cloud capacity uh, that, that you need for, for running that query. And you can pretty much choose the performance by the pricing model. It's, it's, it's very simple. But uh, the way it does this is the way it works with BigQuery is that it allocates slots, which are virtual compute units. Uh, and they represent CPU memory, temporary storage that it takes to execute queries. And then uh, BigQuery calculates its, this automatically by figuring out how many slots is required by, by any query. And then it just scales based on that. So the, the, 
the math is quite simple where the more slots you get, the higher the performance you get. It's, it's not that complicated. So yeah, uh, what I ended up doing in the end is that I wanted to simulate hands-on query latency uh, in BigQuery, where I wanted to simulate a real-world e-commerce app. And the thing I did was I took the, the tests and I ran some on uh, TPCH data. And that's uh, just general data on, on e-commerce with, uh, I used a data set of uh, more than 150 million uh, rows. And I wanted to use this uh, because I want the real, real, real life example. So I set up a few queries that I would need for, for analytics. And this is what I ended up doing. So I ended up writing a query that groups orders by status and day. So if you look down here, you can see that the time it took for the query to execute, and this is not that uh, complicated of a query. It's, it's, it, you know, it's, it's quite okay. It's nothing special. And it took 1.4 seconds to run and it processed 2.7 gigs of data. So if you run this twice, uh, you'll see that latency for the second run is well under a second. And that's because the results of this query will be cached. But if you change the query, you can quite literally just change one thing in the where clause and you'll still experience the same query latency of around a second and a half. You know, and this is the problem. So why is this happening? And the, that, the, the reason why this is happening is because uh, there's something called caching in BigQuery and uh, BigQuery will cache the response of a query. So all of the subsequent queries that are identical will get a much quicker response time. So what you need to know about this is that to retrieve the data from a cache, the uh, duplicate query, with the text itself has to be exactly the same as, I mean, exactly the same. So uh, all of these query results are cached in temporary tables and the cache will be alive for pretty much a day or so, so approximately 24 hours. And then if you're looking at the pricing of these uh, uh, cached queries, it's quite confusing because you're not charged for the queries that use cached results, uh, but these queries are subject to the BigQuery quota, which is, it, it can be a, lot, a bit confusing when, once you start using it. Um, but in the end, we, we come to this pure fact that you can't really expect the latency to be below a second um, because BigQuery is distributed by, by nature and all of the compute units are by default used and shared in between all users. So that's why, I mean, BigQuery, it's, it's just, it's unrealistic. The query latency does not only include the query execution, uh, but it also includes the initialization time. And then you have to build the query and then it has to, to check the quotas and has, has to check the limits and then it has to allocate slots. So it's a, it's a intricate process of, of why it takes so long. And that's, that's why it is just unrealistic to expect BigQuery to provide sub-second query latencies. So it kind of puts us in, in this weird spot where getting a sub-second query latency from a data warehouse is, is almost impossible. It's like a magic unicorn from, from the graph we had um, before. So, but yeah, we, we can't just talk about, about latency. There are so many more factors than just latency uh, that are in play, but let me continue by explaining uh, concurrency. So that would be the next step. Uh, but why concurrency? You know, we, we as, as app devs, we build products for the masses. We, we often have users up, up over a million or so. So the experience they have from, from the uh, experience that we have as developers and developing the app is hugely, hugely different. And that means that I mean, it will never happen that you have one user executing a single query against your app. That's never going to happen in the real world. So your app needs to, be handle, needs to be able to handle multiple queries hitting a database in parallel. So uh, the issue that, that, that these queries will, will uh, come, in, come into is that they will all compete for available resources. So the question is, how would these parallel computing, uh, competing queries so impact the query latency? How will the query latency degrade based on the concurrency going up? And that's something that's, that's quite, a, quite, a, quite a difficult question to answer because BigQuery can provide around a second and a half of a response time for a query that processes almost uh, three gigabytes of data or so. So what would happen for 10? 
I mean, what would happen for 100 concurrent users? Let's say it's Black Friday and you see a spike. What would happen for 100? Um, and th this is why we need to understand what query concurrency is in detail. And that is the amount of actively co-executing parallel queries. And I want to accentuate this actively part. So the actively part means that it's uh, important to figure out because data warehouses can queue queries over a certain limit, and then they can run them when previous queries were completed. So in BigQuery, according to the quotas, a concurrency is capped at 100 queries per project. Now, when you're thinking about it this way, that still sounds like a relatively high number, but we need to be aware of the per project part, which means that the quota is shared in between all apps that interact with the same project on Google Cloud. So yeah. So queries with results that are returned from the query cache are also subject to this to this quota. So we need to keep in, keep that in mind as well. Where this is happening because BigQuery needs to determine whether this is a cache or not, and and that's why it goes into the quota. But even though it goes into the quota, you're not charged money for, for this query. So that's the confusing part. And then we come to this lovely, lovely sentence that I love uh, saying. It's because in my eyes, BigQuery is just a black box. I have no idea what's happening. And the best course of action that I really can do here is to improve the query performance. Because I can't really scale anything out. I can't you know, do anything else for paying more money to get dedicated slots. And you know, nobody really wants to do that. Um, but yeah, I can tell you a bit more about the improvements of the query performance. And here's a quick, quick rundown of how, we, how I would do that. Is first of all, you need to limit the input data and the data sources. So the fewer bytes your query reads, the better. Uh, you, all, you should also never use select, select star because it will scan all of the columns in a data set. And that's a big no-no. And next, you want to improve the communication between slots. And you do that by reducing the data before using a group by or a join clause. Uh, but you also need to use order by and limit only on the outermost queries, uh, because that will improve the computation uh, performance of the queries and then manage the query output. And you remember I was mentioning you need to keep the input low, but you also need to keep the output bytes low. That's also super important. And then once you think about the, the 100 concurrent queries per project cap that BigQuery has, using this, these best practices to improve the query performance is definitely something you have to do. So here's a hypothetical graph that I, that I uh, drew up. Uh, if I expect to have multiple queries run in parallel, um, I need to research and figure, figure out what the query latency degradation will look like uh, whilst the concurrency grows. So hypothetically, I can deduce that BigQuery should be fine handling queries where the concurrency is below 100 queries per second. So naturally, what did I end up doing? I just ended up running a few load tests. And I used a tool called K6. It's open source. It's a benchmarking tool. It's super nice and super simple to use. And I prefer using it. And I, I wanted to measure the response time percentile when using BigQuery directly. Uh, and I was using this through the SDK they provide, uh, Google provi provides through a Node.js API. So it was super simple. And I decided to run a set of, of randomly generated queries because I didn't want to hit the query cache. Um, I wanted to replicate the real world behavior of uh, real users hitting your app because you're never really going to have users hitting the same query all the time. That would be just unrealistic. So I also wanted to use a TPCH data set of around 150 million elements. Uh, I think having such a data set would also simulate what you would have in the real world. And yeah, let me go ahead and show you what the Node.js API would look like, uh, actually look like. It's quite literally just a server and it queries BigQuery through the, uh, through the SDK. And that, that's uh, this line over here. So you get the BigQuery client.query. And then the important part I want to showcase here is that we have, uh, I have added two methods here for generating the, the queries and they are uh, very simple. We have a data and a query method and the data method just generates some random year, month, day values. And then I populate those in a where clause. So it just, just makes sense, makes, makes it so we never have, uh, never have the same query hitting the, uh, the actual big query endpoint. Uh, it's always going to miss the cache, so to say. 
So yeah, so next up, this is quite shocking what, what uh, I ended up seeing. Um, the percentiles for 1995 that I ended up seeing for one concurrent user was the same for 10, for 30, and for 100. And this was, I, I, I didn't, I don't know. I did not, I was not expecting this. It just ended up like be, being some sort of black magic where obviously my hypothesis was totally off. Um, and it really did seem as if BigQuery just worked like magic. In the end, uh, the query latency always seemed to stay around two seconds. doesn't really matter what the concurrency was. And then after 100, it just spiked and just started dropping queries. Um, and that's due to the quota limit. So here's, here's the point where I reached. Uh, I just started asking myself whether it's actually possible to have sub-second latency if you have high concurrency. And, and I was just lost. I, at this point, I was just, I was just lost. So yeah, so we're coming to this graphical representation is where I'm trying to figure out what fits where. And we have sub-second latency with, with high concurrency, that's our goal. Um, and we can't really get that. Traditional databases give us low concurrency and low latency. We have big uh, data warehouses that give us uh, high latency for both low and high concurrency for some reason. So we have this unicorn again where we don't ha really have anything that fits into it. And then this is pretty much why I, uh, I figure this was happening because we, we're getting this high latency with high concurrency because the, the issue I was facing was that BigQuery does not really have a way by default of enabling these materialized views I was, I was mentioning at the, at the beginning. So we don't have any OLAP cubes. So uh, the, these OLAP cubes are, are multidimensional data sets and then we can't really get them by default and we can't generate them by default from these data warehouses. This all means that I can't really pre-aggregate data. I can't really make it quick for querying. I can't, there, there's no, no way for, for me to do that at all. So this is a perfect segue into taking a bit more uh, time and, and getting the latency down because it's currently this is, this is not viable at all. So the next step I want to talk about and what I want to cover next is to, to make it possible to get sub-second latency but retain the high concurrency that I had in the, in the benchmarks. So what did I do? I ended up, uh, I ended up using materialized views with OLAP cubes. And then by doing this, you can generate a condensed version of the source data by specifying attributes from the source itself. Now, this is a very simple, but super, super powerful optimization. And you can reduce the size of the data by several orders of magnitude. It's absolutely nuts. This also ensures that any subsequent query can be served by the same condensed data set uh, if any of the matching attributes are found. Now, this finally means that all aggregations you need will be ready and waiting for you to query them. And this will cut, cut down the response time drastically. And how do I do that? Well, uh, Cube, is a, Cube is a tool that you can use for that. It's just uh, the unicorn that fits perfectly into the story. And let me tell you how and how I built this API. So first of all, Cube is an API server. Uh, it just basically the simplest explanation is that it makes sense of huge data sets. Uh, it doesn't really get any simpler than that. Uh, it's the de facto analytics API for building data apps. And why I think Cube is so cool, it's because it's open source. Uh, over 11,000 stars in GitHub. We have a four, over 4,000 Slack community members. And what you get from Cube is just a out of the box semantic API layer that sits on top of your data where you can manage access, access control, you can manage caching, you can manage aggregations. You get pretty much any database integration. And it's also visualization agnostic where you can use any visualization library you want. Doesn't really matter across the board, they just work. Um, and I, I can, I think I can say that the unicorn is real is you get all these things from one tool, just out of the box. And there's no real hassle, uh, to make it quick and make it work. So the next step I want to show you is how to build an API, uh, with cube. So basically what I did for, for this concrete benchmark is, well, yeah, I was literally just writing a unicorn. I just love this picture so much. It's absolutely beautiful, but yeah. Let's go into the nitty gritty parts. So uh, I'll show you how to run a cube instance and build the analytics API. 
and this will generate all of the queries that I need to run against BigQuery. So. It'll just do all of the heavy lifting for me. Uh, so first up, I'll just configure a simple development setup with Docker Compose. For production, obviously, I would recommend, recommend running a, a Cube cluster. Uh, this requires you to know a bit more about DevOps, and, and you'll have to figure out how to set up a few moving parts. Um, I'll go into that in a, in a bit as well, but not quite yet. So for this dev setup, uh, it will be able to generate SQL queries. And I don't really want to write any SQL. I am an app dev after all, so that's just absolutely lovely. Um, it's also, you have to keep in mind, it's just a single instance, so it's not suitable for, develop, for uh, production. Uh, I would only use it in development. And then to configure this actual uh, access is the only thing you need in, in BigQuery is to set up permissions in a service account. And all of the permissions that you need are literally just here on, on this one screen. Then you generate the key JSON and you add it to a cube uh, config. And this is quite literally everything you would need in a Docker Compose file to set everything up. You just specify, obviously you specify the BigQuery uh, key file and that's it. You can run this in Docker Compose. You can open up the playground and the playground is something we call uh, a space where you can test the queries, you can create schemas, you can generate SQL and do pretty much anything uh, for development purposes. The playground, once you open it up, this is the, the first thing you will see. And here, specifically what I did for the uh, TCPH dataset is I generated a schema file for the orders table. And then once I go ahead and click generate, that will generate a file. And this auto-generated schema file will contain all of the measures and dimensions for any analytics I would need. And this file is what represents the OLAP cube. So this is an important concept. The next up, I wanted to run the exact same query I ran uh, against the TPCH data uh, inside of BigQuery, but I wanted to do it in the playground just to see if the result set would match. And it did, indeed, uh, it actually did, which means that all of these uh, config that I ended up doing worked, uh, worked just as expected. Um, obviously, you can also make sure that the SQL query matches by hitting the SQL tab and then just comparing the SQL that was generated by Cube to the SQL you wrote yourself. And indeed I did, and it did match to the T. So I'm very happy with that. So just one quick uh, disclaimer here is that I was running this in, in dev mode from the get-go. Uh, this means that I ran this query without any pre-aggregations, which means that it will take almost as long as querying a big query directly. Um, and by, by that, I mean that uh, pre-aggregations are these materialized query results that are persisted as tables. Um, they're the condensed version of the source data, but I will explain how to get that uh, in a bit. So just to wrap up here, this is fine for, for development, but definitely not for production. To use uh, pre-aggregations, you need to configure cube for production. And there are two ways you can do that. They're not, not very complicated. Obviously, if you know what you're doing, you can either do self-hosted uh, by running Docker or, or Kubernetes, or you can use Kube Cloud, which is just a, a hosted version. Uh, obviously, if you're going to self-host uh, Kube, uh, the dev setup that I explained right now is super, super simple. You don't need to set up anything. It will just run by itself from the get-go with all of the bells and whistles you need for development. Um, but if you want to run it in production, it will require you to know a bit more about DevOps. Uh, it has a complex infrastructure. It has a few moving parts, and you need to know your stuff, uh, especially about Kubernetes if you want to get this running in production. And this is, this is uh, why I wanted to to do the soft intro about the moving parts. And here's the graphical representation of your, what you would need is that you have a, a store, a cube store for storing all of the aggregations. Then you have Redis for query caching. You have this refresh worker for updating the data in the, of the aggregations and you have an API. So it, it's not simple. If you look at it this way, it's definitely not simple if you want to set this up for yourself. But again, if you know yourself, uh, you'll definitely be able to do it without any hassle. And then of course, uh, if you don't want to have that hassle, um, you can always use Cube Cloud, and that's just a managed version uh, of Cube. Uh, and you get everything, everything from from the get-go by default. So you get managed infra, you get readily available uh, the Cube Store, all of those moving parts you just saw. You just get that uh, by default. You also get auto scaling, meaning that both the user-facing API will scale as needed. The store 
where that uh, stores all of the uh, all of the data for the aggregations will will uh, scale automatically as well. So all of that just hand is handled like magic. Uh, but what I think is the most important part is that you get these pre aggregations enabled out of the box, where you don't need to configure anything. And that's why I think that it's the main benefit of having the pre configured infrastructure. Now this was. This is just a, a representation of what that would look like. If you check the resources section, you will see all of the parts, all of the moving parts of your infrastructure working. You can also see the pre-aggregations, meaning you can get an insight into all of the data that was uh, pre-aggregated and that's ready to be queried uh, much, much quicker than accessing the, the raw data. Of course, uh, here's, the, here's the key. Uh, with pre-aggregations, you get so much so much niceties. Uh, you get a uh, cache that will make your data available for quicker, uh, quicker querying. And it all works on the principle of using materialized query results where these pre-aggregations are materialized ahead of time. And then they're persisted as tables separately from, from the raw data. So you're never really accessing the raw data, which is exactly what you would want. Um, and they're quite literally a condensed version of the source data. So this is, this is quite literally the bread and butter of, of Cube and what makes it so powerful for building uh, data apps. Um, again, querying these pre-aggregations will drastically reduce the execution time because in the end, when you look at the, the data that's pre-aggregated, it's in orders of magnitude smaller than the, than the raw data. And here's what it would uh, graphically look like. On the left side, uh, you see the raw data that has over a million rows. And on the right, you see the aggregated, the pre-aggregated data that has 120 rows. So I think my bet would be that the, the query on the right is gonna take less time than the one on the left. Uh, I think you would agree as well. So uh, the next step I did for, for my, my API uh, to access BigQuery uh, was that I added a pre-aggregation and I, I can do that through the playground. It's, it's super simple. Whenever you run a query, you get this uh, button pop up that says uh, query was not accelerated. You can add it by clicking on the role of designer and you open up the role of designer and you can set the configuration for, for the pre-aggregation. And then the way you add it is you hit this add to schema. It gets added to the schema and you hit deploy and that's pretty much all to it. It's incredibly simple to add the configuration uh, of what data you want to pre-aggregate. And then that's pretty much it. Next time you run the query, it will be accelerated with the pre-aggregation. And then this actual query with the pre-aggregation ran in under 200 milliseconds. So we have a time that was cut down from a second and a half to 200. And I can definitely consider this a win for any, any uh, metrics dashboard or any, anything I would need uh, to build with this data. So yeah, so it's time for some benchmarks again. So I decided to run the exact same low test benchmark with K6, the same one I ran against BigQuery directly. Um, once again, I'm just using uh, the same Node API to figure out the response time percentiles when I'm querying Cube Cloud through the Node API. Um, and just like with BigQuery, I decided to do randomly generated uh, queries uh, just because I didn't want to hit the query cache because again, I want real world behavior to be simulated here. Uh, here's the, the actual Node API. It's Quite literally identical, but I'm running the KubeJS API load. It's just this method will trigger Kube Cloud instead of triggering the uh, directly the BigQuery API directly. Uh, again, I have the same generate data and generate query methods, and again they look exactly the same. Where I'm generating some data for year, month, day, and then I'm passing this data into this date range, which is just a fancy where clause, pretty much. And then here's what I got for 30 concurrent users. I got half a second, give or take. For 100 concurrent users, I'm still getting half a second, give or take. And what you can see here really blew my mind. I got, I got to the point where it was almost five times better than querying big, big query directly. So I, I reached this point while benchmarking where the actual machine I was running the benchmarks on was the bottleneck. The, the API giving me the data wasn't. So that was really cool, to be honest, where I, I ended up throttling the, the machine I was running the benchmarks on instead of the database I was hitting. So yeah, was, that's, a, that's a point of, of how, how cool uh, benchmarking cube was for me. Next up, let me just wrap up quickly with, with all of the things that, well, primarily I did learn and then I just kind of shared with you here today is that I learned that unicorns really do exist. Um, but I also, to, to, be, to be a bit serious, I wanted to, to share some, some limits 
well, more practical and theoretical, but more practical limits on, on what the query latency and the query concurrency is for, for data warehouses. Um, I also wanted to find how to get high concurrency and sub-second latency uh, by creating the, uh, like an analytics API. And Cube helped me do that super, super easily, uh, mainly because of the caching layer. And that can be added to any data warehouse. And in my honest opinion, I think you really need to if you want to build uh, fast and responsive and performant uh, data, data apps. And in the end, I really, I really, like right now, I'm really confident that it is possible to drop the latency below a second while getting con a consistent concurrency of above 100 queries per second, where I saw Cube getting more than five times a better performance than, than just querying BigQuery uh, directly. And in, my, in all of my tests, it ended up just staying at uh, around half a second regarding the percentiles, even above 100 queries per second. So that's super, super cool and super impressive. And then, yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, I hope that I'm within the, the time slot. Um, thanks so much for having me. And of course, if you have any questions, do, do ask away. Um, also, if you want to give Cube a try, you can do that. You can either do that through the docs or you can just read the blog post I wrote uh, on this topic uh, on our blog as well. Or yeah, if you like Cube, go ahead and hit the, hit the star. If you don't, that's all fine. Um, but yeah, that's it. Uh, thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Evan. That was a really, really interesting session. Um, and yeah, everyone say thank you, Adnan, in the comments. If, thank you. Uh, if you enjoyed that, which I'm sure you did. Um, there actually aren't any questions in the Q&A at the moment. Um, if you are tuned in and you do think of a question, please just drop it in there. Um, if there was, so I have a question. If there's one thing that you want people to take away from this session, like if, if they only took away one thing, what would it be? I think it will be that uh, we need to keep in mind that data warehouses, uh, I, don't, I don't think they were ever made with performance in mind. They were made to be, uh, to be okay, as in performance, but they were made to store huge, huge amounts of data, where if we actually want to build apps on top of them, we need to have a middle ground of how we access that data and to make it cost effective, to make it performant and to just you know make it sane otherwise otherwise we'll just go crazy waiting a few seconds to get a response from from a data warehouse thank you uh, we do have a quick question from jd walker isn't that one ods is for again i am an app developer so i have no clue what an ods is <laughs> Me either, actually. So if anybody could uh, <laughs> let myself and Adnan know what an ODS is, that would be uh, also, fantastic. Also, <laughs> yeah, you can also just message me on Twitter uh, as well. I mean, if you have any questions that, that I can't answer now, I'll just I'll definitely look it up and, and ask the, the team. Cool, uh, we will. Uh, oh, operational data store. Okay. Thank you, sure. Um. Okay, that's cool. I, I don't really know uh, if, the, if an ODS would be able to do caching and pre-aggregations and general aggregations of any kind. Because the point of the point of what I wanted to make here is that uh, you need a way of reducing the size of the data you want to query. Because if you're building a metrics dashboard, which was basically the thing I wanted to build, uh, that's something that's going to be queried like all the time. The web values are going to change every minute or, or, or so. Um, these those things are going to need to be pre-generated. I don't want to query my database because querying big query is expensive. It's not free, you know. So I don't want to query that database all the time, spending money all the time whilst waiting two seconds for every, every update. Um, so I think that's the, that's the point of, of the talk in general. But if an, if an operational data store can do that, I mean, definitely. I mean, in the end, we all just want to use a tool that makes stuff work. I mean, it doesn't really matter what it is. We just want, want something that's going to help us solve the problem we want. Uh, Cube, in, Cube just solved it for me here, and I think it's, it's super cool. Yeah, I mean, it's a good point. If, if it works, it works. It doesn't really matter what it is you're using to do it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's why I hate people, uh, the polemics between, oh, is JavaScript better than Python? Then oh, nobody really cares. I mean, it's just a hammer that you, you hit, you know, you use it for, for stuff. It doesn't really matter um, in the end, like, except for like edge cases where you need stuff um, for really, really edge cases. But otherwise, it's almost the same. JD is with you. Platform wars annoy me. Yeah. And um, I'm, I, I, you know, those, you know, those people that say that Kubernetes is better than every, everything else, just because I, that makes absolutely no sense to me. I mean, dude, 
just like whatever floats your boat, whatever, you know, makes your, your job easier, just use it. It doesn't really matter. Kubernetes is, is good for someone, but can be terrible for someone else. I mean, it's just, you have to be down to earth and trying to figure out what's best for you instead of just going with what everybody else says is the best, but doesn't really have to be. In which case, uh, a question we just heard from Eagle could potentially be con- which is uh which data warehouse do you like better from a dev perspective big query or snowflake um i would say uh, i would say big query i would say big query i mean uh, i think huh, but a dev perspective can be very wide as well because you can have devs that um, don't really want to go into any hassle at all and then they end up using firebase that is just you know it's a database but it's literally just an api then you have don't have to do anything but you can also use BigQuery. You can also use Snowflake. It all depends on, I think it all depends on uh, the experience level and the level of hassle you want to put into it. It also can also, exp- can also it's, a, it's a very varied thing, uh, but generally I think it's more of an experience level of what you're comfortable with. Great. Um, and, oh, so JD, it's not a question, but uh, this might be of interest to everybody. So uh, my technical philosophy is the right tool, the right job at the right time used by the right person under the right circumstances, and that can change with each iteration. Platform slash tech wars are a waste of time. Definitely. Definitely. Right, well, JD, JD, thank you. My man, I, I want to grab a beer with you. You seem like a nice <laughs> dude. I really want to grab a beer with you. That's the right philosophy. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Uh, well, what, what beer will you be grabbing with JD? We have we have really really nice like like uh, craft beers here because I'm from Bosnia I'm from Sarajevo and we have this oh, like okay. super local brewery that's like mm-hmm. super lovely and it's uh it's just and I'm also that type of person wherever I go I need to like try the local stuff like either local beers or local whatever um so yeah local food especially now because I was in <laughs> Turkey now I do, I gained like two kilos for like two weeks I, I got fat like i'm not even, i mean it's... have you really been on holiday if you haven't gained weight by the end of it exactly exactly <laughs> so yeah so, exactly oh you see jd beer smart oh, my yeah. man <laughs> it's, true, it's true also belgian beers they have belgian beers that are uh the nicest ones i think are the like the wheat ones in in belgium oh, i do like the wheat there just perfect yeah. just perfect there you go Mm-hmm. Belgian well, we bears, have... something else on a different. Oh, see, JD isn't a Lambics fan. I do really <laughs> like Lambic, but I can see why people don't. It's very, it's not quite a taste. <laughs> uh, also, do, if you ever, if you guys ever end up being in the in the Balkans, like the the spirits we have here, like the what you call, I think you think you call them brandies in the UK. Mm-hmm. The like the local like made brandies we have here in the in the Balkans, they they're made from different types of fruits. Like you have apricots and you have. Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, pears and peaches and all those cool things so having the apricot brandy here in bosnia if you're ever here it's just mm, just perfect perfect you have to if you ever come this way you have to try i will absolutely yeah sounds delicious um, uh well now that we have some drinking recommendations uh is there any is there any other questions by whether you know drink related food related uh data warehouse related please do keep those going in the chat um and yeah then is there anything else that you just really want to highlight to people um anything that you want to go like any like resources that you want to direct people to other than the blog post that you've got there which i'll be having a look at as well uh well yeah i mean the blog post can be a, a first step if you if anybody wants to take a look at this in writing and just go through the examples themselves um all of this is also on on uh, github we have the examples on github you just go to the QJS repo and there's an examples uh, folder there and then under data warehouses we have uh, i have all of the benchmarks and examples there as well if you want to run those yourself um and except for that you can also just uh, ping me on either twitter or github or through my email 
if you have any questions, if you want to talk to me or if you want to get together and have some drinks. Um, yeah, I, I tend, I'm, I'm also like going back to the beginning of the, of the conversation. I'm also vaccinated so I can go anywhere. I am fully hey. good. I'm fully set, fully set. So yeah. <laughs> Vaccine high five. <laughs> I'm, I'm not dangerous. I've also had COVID in March. So I, I both have the antibodies from the, from getting sick and, and the vaccine. So I'm like the safest person right now. There's, there's, can't really get any, any safer than, than me right now. So yeah. There you go. Lovely. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be heading over to Bosnia very shortly then. Well, yeah, um, also, oh. also like the, the measures here are quite quite not strict. So you can just come in and walk around and you know party with all of Grab us. Grab some brandy. Exactly. Exactly. Can't get any better. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, uh, we have another question from, from JD. We do. Is this something yeah. I can set up on my personal laptop? It is maxed out with memory and storage deliberately for things like this. Unfortunately, it has Windows 10, but I can set up a VM with a Linux OS. Yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, the thing, the, the cool thing with uh, with Cube is that everything is through Docker. So if you have Docker installed on basically any machine, it will just work. You don't have to worry at all. You don't even have to use a, a VM. Um, or if you want to, you can use the, the Windows, what's it called? WSL, like the Windows subsystem Linux thing to make it easy for Docker. Or you can just use Docker desktop. It's it's all the same. It's uh, super, super simple. Um, if you just go to the, let me just switch back to the previous slide. You can just jump over to the to the documentation. Just go cube dev uh, slash docs. On the getting started, you'll see all everything you need to know. So that's the cool part about using something, uh, using a tool to to run Docker. So yeah. Uh, so yeah, yeah Eagle says I run cube both in Docker locally and also in cube.dev cloud. Yeah. Of course, of course, cloud is the is the new product we launched. We launched. Uh, uh, was it a month or two ago? It was maybe a month ago now. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, we just literally get the same open source experience that, that we have uh, with the open source tool that's run with Docker. You can just use the cloud version, and it it quite literally resembles. If you if you guys have ever used uh, serverless and anything like serverless uh, stuff like uh, let's say uh, Lambda or or Google Cloud Functions or something similar, or used any uh, serverless databases, it's uh, the concept is very similar because you have an interface in the cloud that handles all of the data. And you just like uh, connect connect to it through APIs and, and through the UI. So it's uh, super super nice. Uh, uh, how do I even say it? I can option that you can use that you don't have to run yourself. It's also mm -hmm. cool because of uh, the auto scaling. So you don't really just pay for the throughput. You don't have to care about anything. Cool. And Igor has very kindly dropped the link to that in the chat as well. So if you want to check that out, it's in there. Also, just to make sure. Uh, mm -hmm. People don't have to uh, click in the whole blog post. I'll just post the blog post there uh, as well. Just give me one second to to get the blog post, uh, because I would hate if people have to remember the actual. There we go. Let's do that. Lovely. Perfect. Cool. So yeah, click away. Give the blog post a read, and yeah, get started, everybody. Yeah. Follow definitely. and add notes footsteps. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. If you also, if you if you guys are any uh, anywhere near uh, Bosnia or Sarajevo, feel free to let me know on Twitter or any anyway. Uh, I'll I'll be super super down for getting together, gra grabbing coffee, talking about nerdy stuff, and or partying. Or both. Most likely both. At the, <laughs> at the club, talking about yeah, data. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what more what more do you want right exactly yeah so um if things are like pretty good in Bosnia sorry at the moment are there any events going on any uh any sequel get-togethers any data get-togethers um, that people should well, be aware not, of not right now we're still we're still only doing the the online events at the moment um, we might we might start doing something uh, in the coming months. Uh, I've been I've been quite be, uh, before all of this with COVID broke out uh, last year. Uh, a few of us, my my one of my buddies and myself, we were hosting a like a CNCF meetup, and that was quite active. And then we hosted some other JavaScript stuff as well. Um, but now we, once you know, when people got really cozy with the work from home, and then they got really cozy with all of the online events, they don't really. Yeah, they don't really feel like going to the to the in in person events anymore. We had one a while back, and it was, I don't know, I'm not gonna say boring. It was just kind of lifeless. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I don't know why. Maybe maybe it's just maybe just the community here is is quite small uh, regarding mm -hmm. that. But yeah, hopefully, hopefully. Maybe it's just that people have forgotten how to interact without a screen. 
you see that's a, that's a fair point that's a that's why I, <laughs> that's why i tried to keep my people skills up by by alcohol <laughs> Yeah, that, that does help. Social <laughs> lubricant. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, uh, JD, Anna, do I actually work for Redgate? Yes, I actually do. I don't just really love Redgate. I, I do actually work for them and I love it. I've been at Redgate for um, just about a year and a half now. I joined just as lockdown in the UK started. So I've actually never had a chance to work in the office. But um, as Adnan was saying, working from home is, is good. It's very cozy. Would you hate me if I asked what Redgate is? <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> so worry. I mean, uh, I, I don't know what, what's wrong with me. I obviously don't know anything. I came to this event and I go, I don't know what ODS is. I have no idea what anybody's talking about. And then I have no idea what Redgate is. I mean, I'm really it's ashamed. okay. Yeah, no, so um, Red, I mean, I work Redgate is a company that I work for. Uh, so we, uh, yeah, we provide uh, SQL Server products and um software that hopefully lots of people tuning in are familiar with and uh if you recognize my background somebody people based in europe might uh our headquarters is in cambridge uh this is not the actual view from the office this is just a lovely picture of cambridge itself <laughs> but yeah if uh if anyone is ever in the cambridge area and wants to drop in and say hi the red gate office is there so we have coffee lovely lovely <laughs> So I'm told, anyway. I know. <laughs> like, you've never been, right? <laughs> I mean, I have been into the office uh, once for my interview. So, uh, yeah. But other than that, it's just been, ah, this is where I would be for it, for it not for COVID. <laughs> true, true, true. Um, you, also, you're an app, application developer, Adnan, and you're not expected to know what an ODS is. That's just a bonus. So now you know. Bonus. Um, I, I'm, I'm proud in my ignorance, I guess. <laughs> 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 and thank you jd for saying such nice things about regate tools um hopefully you're able to use them on a regular basis again in the future it's, uh, yeah they're good tools i might be biased but hey <laughs> um, i was gonna say Adnan, i like your background is that a specific home working setup that you've got going on or Wait, let me think of a good joke. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, this is a, uh, I'm actually just renting a space, actually a desk at the co-working space here uh, in, in Sarajevo. Oh, and nice. As part of uh, the deal we get as, uh, as co-workers, we just get access to all of this beautiful podcasting recording equipment and all these are actually, I use this uh, for my OnlyFans. I have a stripper pole behind this as well. So I- uh, okay. Oh, okay. Is it like a sliding wall? <laughs> Oh my god! No, I'm kidding. Everybody, I'm kidding. tune in <laughs> later. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I love the fact that, like, the, the CEO at, at Cube, he was like, "Bro, as long as you put like on Twitter, uh, tweets are my own. You do whatever the hell you want." <laughs> I love that guy. Man. He's so funny. Uh, but yeah, but hey, let me let me give you a tour. So there's a this is basically the logo of the co-working space. Oh, it's a grumpy cute. cat. It is quite literally a grumpy cat. Um, so yeah, I love it for that. And it's really, really beautiful. We have this like huge podcasting podcasting room here and they do podcasts Amazing. on a regular basis as well. So yeah, so the, the, the dudes are absolutely lovely and I love it here. I really love it here. Yeah, it looks amazing. <laughs> I, I won't show you my background because uh, it's a lot of laundry hanging up. Nobody <laughs> needs to see that. <laughs> uh, tell me you have a cat though. You have to have a cat. I don't know. Uh, so a dog person then. I actually have rats. <laughs> I'm not going to ask him anything else. <laughs> I'm just going to shut up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I didn't live in they're London not... or New York. That's like the. <laughs> no, uh, they're, they're not the most common pet, but um, they, yeah, they, they don't require too much uh, that's input. Cool. That's, cool. that's cool. You I don't, don't even, have to I, walk them. That's cool. I don't even have like, <laughs> I don't even have, what's it called? I don't have fish and I don't even have plants like my apartment is is as empty as it gets you know i'm <laughs> i'm a very lonely individual i have uh I have low nothing. maintenance yeah 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 so i don't really have to do anything at all mm -hmm. is it do you not have plants because you kill them because that's why i don't have plants no i just i just first of all i don't i have potato actually no i had tomatoes in on my balcony mm -hmm. if that counts as a as a because i have a, I have a cleaning lady i mean that's definitely she, a plant and, she, and she's like <laughs> she's like 
do you want me the mommy's like because my balcony is huge and the apartment is quite tiny and then half of the apartment is the balcony so she's like oh let me do something pretty for your balcony and she's like super nice lady and i really love her and i go like yeah sure do do you know and she do want me to like put some like really nice plants in the things in the back yeah sure and and i like go jokingly sure like "Ah, dude i'm i'm a bosnian male i want freaking tomatoes i don't want really and then she goes like sure and I was, like, well, I was joking that it was too late. She already did the tomatoes. So I have tomatoes <laughs> now. I don't, I just, that's just, I guess that's my life now. So yes, I'm, I'm, it's, I, I'm eating, I'm eating cherry tomatoes from my balcony. It's not even, I, I would, like, you can't make this shit up. It's literally, I would love that this was made up, but it's, it's not, it's, it's, uh, it's really, really And I'm not seeing any like, downsides. Fresh tomatoes. Right. Delicious. Right, make fresh salads with cherry tomatoes and like, what's it called? Like Caesar salads and stuff, you know, mm-hmm. it's, you know. Yeah. You can make everyone super jealous on like Insta and Twitter going, look, yeah, I grew these myself. They, yeah, then they, 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 then they see like the rest of my apartment and they go like, eh. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you don't like, take no, pictures I'm, I'm of the bro. rest of it, Adam. <laughs> it's like, I'm, I'm good, bro. I'm good. I'm good. Like, that's fine. This is, I don't want to, I don't want to, oh my God. Ah, shit. Mm. I, oh, that is. Shake that is oh, okay. So serving suggestion for regular sized tomatoes from JD, take a shaker of garlic salt and eat them as if they were apples. That is cool. That is cool. That is legit. I only, I usually just eat, um, I like take full on onions and I eat those as apples. I only know one other person that's ever done that. <laughs> <laughs> How are your taste buds? Do they still I, work? <laughs> I, I, I have, I have strange, I have strange, uh, you know, and there's not much else in life that I find enjoyment in. I'm a very, okay. very sad. <laughs> <laughs> like strong flavor. Me in the face, you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. The thing is, that I had Indian food not so long ago, and like here, yeah. like I'm, the, I'm very Slavic and obviously very pale. You can, like, I'm not good at like taste and stuff and like spice and stuff. Where I mean, I'm very white, you know. So I mean, I'm Irish. We, we just eat potatoes. Then you per, you're perfectly aware. I mean, I, so we had Indian food. <laughs> we don't just eat potatoes. I'm sorry. It was so, <laughs> like it was so tasty, but it it like was pain. It was like it was like nice, and it was painful. Why would why would you want to make it taste good but also hurt? It's just oh, it's worth it though. Good curry. Oh, it is. It is amazingly taste tasty though, but it just hurts like crazy. I was just what? But yeah, luckily. Well, actually, sadly, we don't have a lot of Indian places here, so you know we don't get the the opportunity to to make make <laughs> endorphin. <laughs> it's like I'm so proud to be still alive after eating this, <laughs> just sweating, <laughs> crying. <laughs> yeah, yeah cra- crazy like cold sweat going, and just like, I have to finish this. I have like I have to like. <laughs> what you need is like a big glass of milk. Uh, yeah, Offset yeah. the chili. Ah, oh, that's true. That's true. Oh God. But yeah, <laughs> we, we have we have no spice here at all. That's just uh good curry will help fight off head colds, apparently. That is true. That is true. That is true. Mm-hmm. That's why I do the onion. I just like take a bite of the onion and I'm good, you know. Yeah, I'm like, okay. I might have to try that next time I catch whatever's going around. <laughs> Hopefully not COVID. <laughs> uh, but yeah, what I what I figure for COVID is that I didn't have that like huge of a reaction because I just pop a lot of vitamins on, like, on a regular basis. Uh, mm-hmm. Also, I figured out that like zinc is a super nice uh, supplement as well. So like zinc and selenium, they have magnesium, of course. But yeah, I just tend to pop a lot of those like supplements because I recently started uh, going to the gym quite, quite intensely. Because then I figured, mm-hmm. like, I, I heard that on a podcast somewhere that there are certain types of, of supplements that help, help you like regenerate your body. And then by helping helping it, your, your, your like immune system regenerate, it also just helps your immune system in general, like fight off colds. So mm-hmm. yeah, that's like for all of you guys and girls that, that like want to build up your immune system, like doing like regular exercise and, and eating healthy and just like eating proper, like proper meals and not just like skipping meals. Like, because we're, we're engineers, we're like, forget eating and stuff because we got like work and stuff so coffee just, like, is, be... is a breakfast right does that count <laughs> like does tea <laughs> does water coffee as like water coffee and tea does that count as like lunch i don't so that's just um for many of us for many of us definitely we just don't eat properly 
And then I figured like all of those things, I started eating healthy and started popping all of these like C vitamins, D vitamins, like especially like the the D vitamins, because places like the UK and especially here in winter, you don't get a lot of sun. It's a lot of, uh, yeah, it's a lot of clouds, a lot of background uh, lies. Yeah. So, you know, (laughs) we, we get a lot of sun here during the, during the summer, but there's like six months of just fog and smog and snow and shit here. So we just, you know, the D vitamins are super, super important. Um, so yeah, so, so once I started drinking all of those things, like the general effect it has on your immune system is, is uh, super, super positive. So mm. for all you guys that haven't been sick with COVID, just start popping those DC vitamins and all of those things. And, and I assure you, you're going to make sure to, to keep healthy. And it's always good to take care of yourself, especially in these drizzly and cloudy times. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I'm, I mean, I'm for anyone I'm going to like <laughs> Dubai or like uh, Canary Islands for like a month or so during January because January is absolutely miserable, miserable here. Um, mm-hmm. It's just cold, and I don't, I don't know how to ski. And we have like mountains and stuff here, but I don't know how to ski. So snow, I, I just, I just don't go with snow at all. Like I hate it. Just do the all. the apres ski part. Like you just just go sit with a hot chocolate and a chalet. You somewhere. see, that's what it, I don't mind driving up to the mountains and just chilling. Yeah. And I just you know that's fine. But like the skiing and like the any physical contact I have with snow is just no. I don't I don't look I don't like that. So yeah, mm-hmm. so I'm thinking. A buddy of mine was like, yeah, let's go to Dubai for like a month, and then we saw the prices, and I'm like, fuck that. Let's go to Gran Canaria because that's kind of <laughs> affordable. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeah so maybe, a little bit cheaper maybe probably yeah maybe, maybe probably go to go to the canary islands for a bit we were in morocco morocco is super mm-hmm. cool um yeah or um chris who was moderating the session before this he's, <laughs> he's off to egypt oh yeah egypt is beautiful Very soon. Mm-hmm. As well. yeah egypt is freaking beautiful yeah. um but yeah but Dubai so remind is yourself of what places. the sun looks like uh, yeah but you know but again once again like dubai is just one of those places that it's it's just surreal it is it's just like Disneyland for adults. It's just a playground that costs a shit ton of money. And you'll just, <laughs> you'll just like get blown away by how, how crazy it is. Uh, but yeah, if you ever have the opportunity, two things you have to see in your life, Cappadocia, Turkey and Dubai. Mm-hmm. The rest can just, you know, is a far number two. Okay. Put those on the list. Uh, oh. I can tell you we're not going January anywhere in the Northeast in the US. <laughs> that, <laughs> is from that, is so that is so true. That is so true. Damn, man. Yeah, but like, it's basically anywhere in the Northern Hemisphere in, in winter is terrible, except for like the Mediterranean or like, I don't know, like uh, around Mexico, Cuba. Those I guess it depends how much you enjoy snow, though. Because like coming from the UK, we don't really get proper winter. It just rains. So uh, I get really excited when I go anywhere with snow because like, I don't get it. Oh, seriously? Well, I mean, we get it sometimes, but it's really dreadful, like slushy gray snow and it never lasts. Like, then you should definitely, like you should head up here to, uh, to Bosnia because we have beautiful mountains and the snow is just lovely. And it's, it's I like gotta say, Alps, Adnan, you're selling snow. Bosnia to me. I am. I work in, like mm-hmm. the, the alcohol is affordable. Uh, people are very beautiful. Like both men and women were absolutely gorgeous. I'm not a good representation of that. I swear to you. Uh, <laughs> I just You're being far too hard on yourself. <laughs> yeah, I just do the pole dancing. That's the only plus upside I have. Uh, okay. Anyways, <laughs> but the rest of it, like food, is amazing uh, because here in the Balkans is just we had so much influence from from the like Turkey and the Middle East, but also from uh, the Slavic countries. So the food is just absolutely lovely. We get all of our alcohol from our Slavic background, which means that we're great with all types of alcohol. Um, and we just, you know, we just have nice mountains in the winter and really nice uh, seaside, like Mediterranean uh, weather in the summer as well. So whatever floats your boat, you can come join. I will do, yeah. And hi, Magnus. Hey, hey. Hi. How's it going? It's good. Well, I, I'm doing, you know, sickly with children and, and trying to do some work. Uh, in, but now I kind of, I'm off the day shift for the, for the child care. So. Mm-hmm back in the office oh, hope they're feeling better soon sorry uh, i hope you hope your kids are feeling better soon like that's... yeah i mean it, it, it's basically no big problem it's a cold but these days that it, it, i mean you can't really meet people so it is how it is yeah it's not fun to have a cold and be you know yeah yeah most of the day <laughs> 
Sorry? How was the day so far? Well, we just had an excellent session, courtesy of Adnan. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, there have been some great sessions today. I've been tuning into bits and bobs of different ones. Um, and we were, we were just discussing the very important question of where to go to escape the Northern Hemisphere winter. <laughs> <laughs> so how to have fun in sure? the winter while ex just really not going anywhere where there's snow, just avoiding mm -hmm. all of the snow in the Northern Hemisphere and just having just not snow experience. Um, yeah, I was just saying that I hate snow, like really passionately hate snow. So we're trying to figure out uh, where to go this winter and just avoid all of it. Yeah, I, I kind of do too. And living in Sweden, that's the wrong country to hate. Snow. Oh, yeah, it's not ideal. So you're in Sweden, where about? Uh, close to Stockholm. Uh, oh, so we can put the Svenska also. Absolute. Har du bott i Sverige? Ja, 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 för det Sverige. Uh, in ah, all right. Yeah. So sorry, yeah. Eleanor, we just, uh, we had just. <laughs> <laughs> I understood one uh, word. <laughs> it's, sure. it's like the Swedish chef, you know? <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, yeah, it was just, uh, just a combo we had because I was born in Sweden. Um, so uh, I know a bit okay. of Swedish. Mm -hmm. Where about? Uh, so I was born in, in Javle, very close to Stockholm. Uh, I grew up in Gothenburg. Okay. I have spent too much time in Yavla, but uh, yeah. it's, there's not much to see. Uh, trust me, it's a uh, it's a nice it's, city, but it's not that not that huge. Gothenburg is lovely, though. Gothenburg is super super lovely. I do love it. My have my my cousin moved there because he he's a, a fan of the you've got the boy football team. Oh, so, dude, yeah. Was that yeah. his main reason for moving there? Because. <laughs> It's actually the only reason he didn't even have a job, but he moved there. To get, to get wow. It. He was really, really. Oh, that is that dedication team. right there, man. That is serious dedication right there. Oh, it is. Oh, God. That is nice. That is cool. That is a man. super fan. Yeah. But what do you, what do you do, Magnus? What's your, what's your background? Uh, I'm a SQL Server consultant since a couple of years. I, I've done, you know, I started as a web developer. Uh, and it's kind of fun because if I if I look at the development teams who do front end development, if I look at what they do, I'm like, that's this work. I don't know, but uh, I used to be at least half good at it. But I I focused on the back end and uh, databases. And uh, for the past I think ten years, SQL Server is all I've done. Except for one year, I was a manager. And that was the worst year of my career. So. <laughs> well, obviously, yeah, you know. <laughs> I mean, I, I didn't mind the the management part of it, and uh, you know, uh, leading the actual development. But I wanted to get my hands dirty as well. So. Yeah, I can I can see that. I can see that happening. Um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not even half decent at, at programming myself, and I'm I'm super still kind of young. Uh, so yes, yeah, so I I'm I think like I'm proud of being one of those. I'm I'm more into bl blogramming than actually programming. So I, I do I do more of this like writing and educational shit than actually doing real coding. Uh, but yeah, I see Daniel's mugshot, but I don't see it. there. He is. Ah, there hello. He is. And then one second of joining the session, I've learned a new word: blogramming. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I am super proud, but also kind of ashamed of it. But you know, it is what it is. Uh, <laughs> it's for I, a I good should, cause. Should, yeah, I should I should definitely put that like on a tagline on Twitter, like uh, blog blog grammar or something like that. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna trademark it for sure. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to trademark it so nobody steals it. Because, <laughs> dude, Daniel, man, you're like you're you're shady now. Like you you like it way too much. You, you like you you're gonna. You're I mean, gonna... you can trademark all you want, but you need to pursue and and you know keep after people and we know we know i'm not gonna do that so <laughs> so in in the meme word i'm stealing this <laughs> <laughs> oh god you better uh, watch yeah. out if adnan yeah, starts getting you... litigious <laughs> there we go uh yeah let me just sh switch slides to where you can contact me you can get me at uh, on twitter or github or whenever wherever. you can also follow me on instagram i have a really fire instagram where i post memes and shit um all my seven followers are super happy where am i <laughs> what is this channel <laughs> oh my god oh god yeah sure i want to uh, know how the, that pointer it's it's like it's like tiktok but for grown-ups basically 
I thought TikTok was for grown-ups. <laughs> I I am ob- <laughs> grown-ups. I'm I'm way too old to figure out how TikTok works. I'm I've never really figured out how that works. And to be honest, I'm yeah. If, if anyone from- has figured out how to work TikTok, please let us know in the chat. Yeah, we're, we're all like I mean, my ten-year-old niece works. You know, knows TikTok. I could probably ask her. Please do. Can we get that? Can we, can we get That's her on the conference next to explain how mm-hmm. TikTok works for all, us old people? I'll just, yeah, like, introductory <laughs> TikTok for DBAs. <laughs> Level one hundred. Well, you know, my my daughter, she's thirteen, so it was called musically in in the beginning. I don't know. And it sounds like a long time ago. It was probably three months ago that they changed names because things happen so fast. But initially I said, okay, so, so you post videos of yourselves. You can't do that. Uh, but that didn't work. That, that kind of, it, it blew up. So, so now I had to learn something about TikTok to at least, you know, I have to follow her and I have to kind of control who is contacting her and so on. Because <laughs> too young to, to be responsible on her own on the internet. So. But saying no, oh, that didn't work. Having been a 13 year old girl, I, I can confirm. It doesn't necessarily. <laughs> I've never, I've never, I've never really been a 13 year old girl, so I wouldn't know. I'll just trust all of you on that. <laughs> there was no internet when I was 13. Oh yes. No, and, and we were faking stamps when we were sending the these you know tapes with games on them. So faking stamps is you you put like a sugar solution on the stamp so that when they oh. uh, put the marker on it, you can then just put some water on and be used to stamp. That I mean that's that's our uh, you know that's what we did. And uh, we met up and there were probably some mean people and, and so on in the conferences where we didn't sleep and drank a lot of Coca-Cola and uh, probably some caffeine pills, but n- nothing worse. We were at least kind of, the only times we could meet digitally, we were sitting next to each other's computers. So. Yes, reminiscing about the old times. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone remember, remember the dial up internet sound? Oh, yeah. And like, oh, you yes. carried your PC to your friend's house when you're like playing games together mm-hmm. on LAN parties. Mm-hmm. Oh, dude. I went to a LAN party in Denmark. I literally <laughs> carried a computer and a disc box this large with just floppies, um, hundreds of them. And I would come home with all of them. I mean, was it's it, all wasn't that like that statute of, of, of limitations now, but, but this was 92, perhaps. Of- gaming man that's just a pinnacle yes. like when gaming was on point man like playing like counter-strike 1.6 back in the day god man yes and like yeah, diablo yeah. 2 be- like diablo 2 before the new like resurrected thing got out like the other month or so you remember oh dude that was the best game to play online ever man yeah <laughs> oh my god we used to have um um uh, one of my uh places i worked we were a bunch of consultants we we, we used to rush down to the bottom floor to have lunch and we would have lunch in six minutes flat or something plus the time it took to actually pay for it and then we would rush back up to the office and the rest of the lunch break would be like um, player versus player um, counter-strike we switched to call of duty as eventually but it was absolutely nuts and we had a lot of people who were not traditionally gamers um so um, older folks uh, uh, and, and all sorts of people who would, you know, never play a first person shooter would just participate for the fun. I thought that was just a great inclusive experience. Um, you have to start doing that again. Cool. Let's yeah. do meetups for gaming and not for like databases. That would be, that'd be fun. Yeah, like a Counter-Strike <laughs> tournament for, for middle-aged <laughs> database professionals. <laughs> With a slow sensor. You can join too, Eleanor, even though you're Thank not middle-aged. You. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I will be eventually. It's not that far away. <laughs> I mean, you need to start practicing. It's true, yeah. What's, the, what's even the definition for middle-aged, man? I think that's we're being ageist right now. We have to, like, the code of yes. conduct. We have yeah. to look at the code of... That so is true. To... Oh, hi, JD. <laughs> it was nice chatting to you. Jumping over to another track. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess you're only as old as you feel. And yeah, that's true. That's some true. mornings I feel about 87. <laughs> oh, it was me this morning. I can totally agree. <laughs> it's like coffee was invented. Hi, Ellen. I, 
Sorry, I've heard that old Hello. people get up early in the morning and that's still not happened to me. Does that mean I'm young? Yes. I'm really tired in the morning, so I'm probably just 25 still. There you go. I hear what you say, Excellent. but it doesn't mean that you're <laughs> just, just hold on to it. <laughs>